Hello and welcome to today's Eurostar webinar, Tips for Writing Better Charters for Exploratory Testing Sessions with Michael D. Kelly. My name is Paul and I will be your moderator for today. Before I hand you over to Michael, I just want to bring a few things to your attention. The presentation will run for approximately 30 minutes and will be followed by a Q&A session. If you'd like to ask a question during the Q&A session, just do so by typing it into your control panel on the right-hand side and I will ask the question to Michael. This webinar is being recorded and the slides will be available on the Eurostar blog. Feel free to join the conversation over on Twitter during and after the webinar using the hashtag ESConf. Before I hand you over to Michael, we'll start with a quick poll. The question is, how many of you have written and run exploratory test charters in the past? And the results are in there now, 42% yes, 58% no. Um, without further ado, I'll hand you over to Michael. Michael, are you there? Yes, I am. All right, well, hello, everyone. Looks like uh, about half of you have done exploratory testing using charters in the past, which is good. For the other half, we're going to do a brief overview of uh, what, what it means to be using test charters for exploratory testing. A little bit about myself. Uh, I'm currently a managing partner at Developer Town, which is a small company in Indianapolis, Indiana, in the United States, which focuses on working with startups to launch their products in the marketplace. And a lot of the testing that we do here, uh, obviously aside from the test driven development and all the stuff our development team is doing, is uh, all done with exploratory testing using uh, session-based test management. In the past, I was also one of the um, early board members in the Association for Software Testing, and for two years, uh, along with some other really great um, folks, I ran the organization and uh, launched our conference series and uh, some initial publications and was um, pretty involved in trying to get some other um, organizational opportunities off the ground. Uh, after that, um, that's kind of when I, I got involved in uh, Developer Town and what we were doing here. Over my the history of my career, I've written uh, hundreds of articles, um, blog posts, and a couple of books I contributed to. Uh, the one that's most relevant to this talk is How to Reduce the Cost of Software Testing, where there's a chapter in there that spends a lot of time focused on session-based test management if you're more interested at a high level about how session-based test management works and where this fits within that process. So one of the, a, a couple of really important things when we talk about exploratory testing is that, um, and, and this is part of what's going to come through in this talk when you talk about tips for making your charters um, more effective and more crisp, is that one of the things that we value as a community is that the tester, the way they work, and their ability to do the work in the future is as important as the product being tested, which means one of the underlying tenets of what you're doing when you're doing exploratory testing is not only you're making the product better, but you're making the tester better. And you'll see that some of these tips uh, I wouldn't necessarily use on every project, I wouldn't use with every team, and I, I certainly wouldn't use them in all situations. Uh, but each of them has a slightly different focus. And one of the underlying themes that you're going to see in these, these tips is that the tester, the way they think about the product, the way they think about coverage and risk, and the way that they interact with one another when you're working in a team is, is pretty fundamental to some of these tips. And so you'll, hopefully you'll, you'll see that emerge. The other big thing that I, I wanted to highlight, and for those of you who have done um, charter-based testing before, uh, certainly this, this comes to the forefront. But even if you've not done uh, charter-based testing, even if you've only done more, more scripted testing, you should have struggled at some point in your career or might be struggling today with coming up with good test ideas. And it's a fundamental problem of software testing. How do you come up with good test ideas? How do you come up with them quickly? And how do you prioritize and communicate them to the rest of the team and then start executing them? And another big piece of 
these tips that you're going to see is helping facilitate that process of how do we come up with an overabundance of good test ideas or even mediocre test ideas and then kind of bubble sort them to get the good ones up to the top so then we can we can execute those on the project. And so I would say if there are two underlying themes to these tips, it's that you, the tester, is as important as the product and so that's why we're investing a little bit of time and that one of the fundamental problems of software testing is coming up with good test ideas in a, in a timely fashion and then structuring those in a way that we can execute on a project. So what's exploratory testing? I love James Box's definition. There's a lot of other uh, pretty good definitions out there. His is crisp, simple, direct, simultaneous learning, test design, and test execution. And in a kind of traditional scripted testing project, you might have a person sit down, review requirements, uh, do some test design, think of what a, the good tests are going to be, write those down. Then with the separation of time and space, potentially, maybe not, uh, and perhaps even a, a different person, maybe not, would sit down, execute that test, capture the results, report that back to the team, and then, with again, with the separation of time and space, and perhaps even another person, somebody might come back, look at that, design a new test, and repeat that cycle. And exploratory testing is simply a philosophy that says, let's collapse all that into one simultaneous act, where each test you run inform the very next test you're going to run. And nothing, so there are no sacred cows in exploratory testing. And so that's the theory behind it. That's what we're trying to do. And there's a number of different ways to, to structure that. I love this image that John Bach put together a couple of years ago coming out of um, an exploratory testing summit where a bunch of really bright people who let me tag along um, sat down and, and talked about um, what's really unique about exploratory testing. How do you do it? How do you do it well? What are some of the challenges? And John came out of that with kind of this idea to explain that testing is really a continuum. On one end, you have purely scripted, right? And that the most purely scripted test you could possibly have is an automated test, right? It's, it's codified, and there's no deviating from it. The program is going to do exactly what you tell it to do. And on the other side, you have what people classically think of when they think of exploratory testing. It's a tester in front of a keyboard doing whatever that tester wants to do in whatever order they want to do it. And What's interesting about that is there's there's a very large space in between that very few people talk about. And uh, a lot of this presentation is tackling that middle space. Everything from most teams that do scripted testing and write big, long Word documents, even there, they, over time, will start to have one script point to another um, to try to reduce documentation overhead and stuff like that. So over time, you, you start to build kind of vague scripts in certain areas and then very specific scripts in other areas. Uh, some teams will document scripted test cases for some things, but not others. In other areas, they'll rely on checklists or exploratory testing or scenarios. And then as you get closer to the exploratory testing side, sometimes teams will choose to structure their, their work for metrics and reporting purposes with charters. Sometimes we'll use roles or personas, and all of those are just kind of different ways of, of facilitating the testing. And, and I put this up here to specifically say that in this talk, we're talking about charters and, and where that fits. So there is a little bit of structure that we're imposing on our testing when we're using charter, charters, but it's not as much structure as scripted testing. And different projects um, that, I've, that I've worked on have had even different rigor within, within that chartering process. I've worked on FDA regulated projects where we had a ton of detail in our charters and a ton of notes that came out of them. And then at Developer Town, as you can imagine, we do a lot more consumer product stuff. And so we don't have a ton of, of charter notes, and we don't have a ton of details in the setup. We're much more interested in the bugs that come out of it and the conversations that happen between the tester and the developer after the testing is complete. So when you're working in charters, the most common method that I'm aware of for managing exploratory testing um, using charters is session-based test management. And this was created by uh, John and James, refined by many, many others. And it's uh, a, a practice that um, John and James wrote a paper on. Uh, if you Google session-based test management, it's going to be the first thing that comes up. And, and, and how you structure the work and what metrics you can get off of that for the team. We're going to cover those a little bit um, in, in some areas. 
but it's a, it's a great way to introduce exploratory testing to a team that's used to doing scripted testing and because it gives the team some metrics that they're familiar with. You can still count charters. You can still measure how many you have complete. You can still do some of those things that, that larger teams are used to doing, um, but also recognizing that there's value in having a more fluid test design and test execution process. All right, so what makes up a charter? A charter is time boxed. And uh, what that means is you've got some period of time in your head for how long you expect that to take. It could be 30 minutes, it could be 15 minutes. If you're testing mobile apps, I found that my charters for mobile testing tend to be much, much, much smaller than they ever were when I was testing web apps. Um, and if you're doing performance testing or something that, or security testing, something that takes a lot of setup, your charter might be two hours. But whatever it is, the team has kind of agreed that when we talk about a unit of work, we're talking about this period of time, and that's kind of our default. A session is going to have notes, and so anytime you're running your testing, you're going to be taking notes about uh, what it is you're doing, what data you're using, what you're finding, and some teams have developed shorthands for, for dealing with that. I think we're going to explore those later in, in one of the slides, uh, some examples of what I've done in the past. When you're doing session-based test management, after each session you're doing a debrief. It's a one-on-one -on -one conversation or a two-on-one -on -one conversation where you get the test manager and the tester together or the developer and the tester together and they talk with one another about what happened, what they found. They talk about risk based on what they've learned and what's the next best thing that the team should focus on. Another big part of session-based test management is team prioritization, that collectively we decide where's the biggest risk that we should tackle based on the time we have in front of us. Ad hoc test documentation tends to be a feature of session-based test management. It's instead of saying let's document everything up front, as you identify something that's worthwhile to document to share with the rest of the team, that's when you document it. Ad hoc test automation also tends to be a theme within session-based test management teams. Instead of saying we're going to automate 100% of everything, we instead say, okay, I just ran that test. That seemed really valuable. I can see myself wanting to run that test again in the future. We should potentially consider automating that test. And so your automation suite emerges over time based on what individuals on the team consider valuable. And in session-based test management, there are very dynamic, uh, very dynamic metrics in reporting. So chartering. I would argue that chartering is the most difficult part of working in session-based test management. And chartering is how you take your work and you make it meaningful to the rest of the team. You scope out what you're going to do from a risk and coverage perspective and you document that in a way that you can hand off to somebody else and they could execute it, or that when you go to execute it, it guides you and helps you come up with good test ideas. And my personal experience is, when I first started going down this path, this was absolutely the most, experience, the most difficult piece for me, and later managing teams that do exploratory testing, this was absolutely, without question, the most, the most difficult part of exploratory testing for my team. And I learned a lot going through that, not only with myself, but with others, about what's worked and, and what didn't to, to help people come up with ideas and structure those in a meaningful way. How do you know if your chartering is bad? One of the things that I point to uh, is that if you're running your test, you've got 45 minutes that you're supposed to be testing a specific thing, and, and about halfway through, you kind of get lost and you say, well, wait, what am I supposed to be doing again? or you get about halfway through or towards the end and you say, I need more time. There's no way I can get everything done that I'm supposed to get done. Or your energy level is really low and you're bored and you know, it, it's hard for you to stay engaged. And I'm not going to read through all of those, but it, it's important to just recognize that there are key characteristics you can, you can see in yourself and in others when you're doing your testing that can be signs of bad chartering. It just means that the mission wasn't clear enough. What this means to the product? and the project team is that you don't get the right coverage, that things get ignored, that things get missed. Sometimes teams duplicate effort where because it's not clear what I'm supposed to be doing and what John's supposed to be doing, John and I start testing the exact same thing. Uh, people get frustrated and it's really hard to tell what's actually been covered within the product. There are three essential elements of a charter. And I've said these already, and I'll probably say them again. Risk, coverage, and time frame. Risk is why you're running this test. What could go wrong? What's the concern? What are you looking for? 
this is the overarching theme of the types of problems that, that you're trying to address by running this test. Coverage is where you're going to look for those problems. It's what you're testing. It's features, streams, artifacts, areas of the product. It's, it's your indication of where somebody should be focused while they're looking for those risks. And time frame is pretty self-obvious. It's how long it should take to do this. And it, it's there to give guidance around um, kind of the, the level of effort that's going to be required to get, to get that done. So if you're doing chartering well, when you look at a, t a list of 10 charters, you should see 10 distinct testing missions. And that should, if you're doing one hour sessions, equate to roughly 10 hours of head down testing. If you're not doing that, if, if when you look at your charter list, you don't see that, then you need to look at the way you're doing chartering. And these are the tips that we're going to look at specifically around better chartering. And I, I'm pretty sure the slides are going to be made available after this, so you don't need to write these down. And we're going to, we're going to walk through these step by step. So the first thing I try to do is look at very specific risk and coverage targets. Uh, a common example for people who are doing chartering for the first time is that first line. Test the portal for reporting accuracy. Now, if I gave this charter to you and you knew what the portal was and uh, you have con some concept of what reports were out there, it would be meaningful to you and it, you would feel like, yeah, I can probably go out to the portal and pull down some reports and test them for accuracy. But it's not meaningful enough. This is a clear call for action because if you put this charter out there, it would be unclear by the end of it what was actually covered. It would be unclear if there was going to be duplication of work by some people looking at some reports, other people looking at others. And I think you could just crisp this up and make it better. So the, the, an example of how you might do that is you would say test reports X, Y, and Z. So name the specific reports, income statement, balance sheet, whatever they are. Uh, and look for errors related to end time selection criteria, summing, totaling, rounding. Name the specific risks, right? So what you see in this in this um, in this coverage target is you, you see very specific items that people are looking for and very specific risks uh, or areas of risk that they should be looking at. And that is a great charter. And somebody can look at that and say, yeah, I can get that done in 45 minutes or no way that's going to take me an hour or two hours, or I think I can get all that done in 15 minutes. Uh, what's the big deal here? Another thing you can do to um, help with charter generation and making sure that you've got the right risks uh, and coverage areas identified is get familiar with some mnemonics that are out there that will help you generate ideas for coverage. These are some of them that are out there. If you Google any one of these, you'll come up with um, uh, either an article or a PDF by James Fox that will walk you through them. Um, a lot of these are here. Is the coverage, coverage and risk, quality criteria, and, and test techniques all come from um, a, a document he uh, put together a number of years ago that is just priceless. If you've not seen it before, um, and each after each letter in those acronyms spells out a specific type of um, test technique, coverage area, or um, Thing you might focus on when you're doing your testing. And as, a, as an example, if you look at quality criteria, prescription sample, um, that stands for capability, reliability, usability, supportability, scalability, maybe. I might be wrong on that one. Um, performance, installability, compatibility, and the list just goes on. And, and it's not important that you can remember each and every one of those letters all the time, because I can't, and I use these things all the time every day. Um, but it's important that you know that they're there and you can call them when you need to. And when you're doing your chartering, it's very handy to have a stack, uh, a bullet list of these right next to you while you're doing your chartering. So you can just check off, did I think about this? Did I think about this? Do I have a charter that covers this? And it, it's just a great checklist for, for developing test ideas. One of the common things that, that we find when we do chartering is that um, people try to capture too much information into the test charter itself. And, and slowly over time, your test charters, instead of becoming um, mission statements, become detailed descriptions of how the product is supposed to work and, and what's supposed to be in there. And if you see that in your charters, I won't say that it's necessarily a problem, but it, but it, it might not be the most efficient way to capture that information. And so one of the things that we've done early on in projects where the complexity of the product is, is so great that you, you just have to capture that information somewhere. It's unrealistic to expect that 
that a person um, looking at a charter is going to just know how things are supposed to work, is we would build out a testing team with you detailing those nuances, um, but very specifically focused on the testing problem, right? So that wiki page might include a feature checklist. It might include um, example test data or common client test data, um, known issues and gotchas and, and, and stuff like that. And there's um, some great examples I have from a past life working in telephony where if you've never worked in telephony and don't know about things like CTMF and don't know about um, uh, utterance interrupts and stuff like that, that list of kind of known issues and gotchas is priceless. And new people coming into the team need access to that stuff. It, it's not enough to just put a charter in front of them. But the answer is don't put that in the charter. Put that somewhere that's in a common knowledge base that people can find. Another great way to identify if you have a problem is to take a, a set of charters that look to be similar and compare them and just see what the difference is. If you can't answer what the difference is between three charters like this, test feature X, stress test feature X, performance test feature X, then you have a chartering problem. And that's going to lead to confusion when you go to execute. And while this is a very easy example to, to, to see that discrepancy, um, it, it's very common that a lot of times when you pull out a set of charters relating to a feature, and you just line them up and sort them. And then you, you ask the team, say, OK, tell me what's different between each of these. It's sometimes very, very difficult to do. And that's an indicator of a problem. And it, and it, it can be as simple as going in and just adding a, a little bit more detail on the coverage area or a little bit more detail on the, on the risk area. So when you say stress test, what do you mean? What are the specific things that you're looking to stress? When you say performance test, what do you mean? What are the specific times that you want to measure or um, load numbers that you want to uh, achieve or whatever is meaningful for that chart or whatever it is you're trying to get at. And in some cases, you'll find for things like performance test feature X, it's probably too vague anyway. That really needs to get broken up into four or maybe five different charters. So one thing that we do to help with this is a lot of times we'll use this charter template, which if you've ever done written Agile stories, um, you're kind of familiar with this, right? In the Agile world, it's as a role, I want some feature benefit, or sorry, I want some feature so I can receive some benefit. And the, the three things that you're swapping out there are uh, role, feature, and benefit. And in chartering, I find that this can sometimes help for early teams who are getting started uh, or for people on your team who have never chartered before. Just give them this template and say, look, insert your risk here. My mission is to test for security-related bugs, in, and then you insert the coverage area in um, the URL uh, that we're putting out there for, um, for our users. Their mission is to, to try to hack the URL to see if they can get to areas of the site that they're not supposed to, um, break user permissions, jump into somebody else's session, whatever it is. Um, this can sometimes be really helpful for people who are just getting started to remind them it's all about risk and coverage and you need to detail both. Sometimes it can be helpful to do um, much smaller sessions. And so um, there was a, a period of time uh, that we were doing a, a ton of iPhone apps. Uh, one of them that we did was for Qantas International, which is a not-for-profit. And I found that it was more beneficial to me to do 10 to 5-minute charters. When I did 45-minute charters, I just got, I, I just, the, the complexity of the application was not big enough to support that. So after about 20 minutes, I would feel my energy start to wane, and I just couldn't stay focused. And then once I, I brought that down to these like more tightly crisp, um, succinct charters, I stayed on task much, much better. I felt like I was making a lot more progress, and I had more real-time feedback for the development team, which was awesome. And if you look at some of these charters that I've listed here, you see that they're dirt simple. They, you know, some of them really are, you know, 10 minutes in length, and and that can sometimes be very motivational, and can also help um, people who are new to chartering do charters with a lot less risk. Another thing that we do a lot of is thumb voting. And uh, thumb voting is, is very simple, right? Everybody on the team, everybody in the room has to put their thumb up, sideways, or down. And this can be useful to determine priorities. So when your team does a chartering session, whenever we would kick off a release um, at, a, at a, a, a larger company that I worked for, we had seven testers all doing session-based support for testing, is we would say, okay, 
we're going into this grant. Everybody's got to write their high-level charters for what they think they're going to get accomplished this grant. Then at the end of Monday, we're going to get together and we're going to thumb vote to see which ones we actually plan on doing this grant. And so everybody would submit their charters. We put them in Excel um, real quickly. And then as a team, we just walk through one by one. We'd read the charter. If anybody had questions, we needed to clarify it, we would do it. And then as a group, we would thumb vote to see if we had agreement around the, the scope and clarity of, of that charter. And priority is a great way to make sure everybody's on the same page with what it means to do a charter. The most common thing that would occur is somebody would say, this is high priority, and the person right next to them would say, this is a low priority. And the confusion was that the clarity of that charter was not uh, was not right, that pe two people looked at the exact same words and came up with two very different meanings. And it's a great way to ferret that out. And it, it builds the entire team up over time where you get to have those discussions, it develops common language, and it gets people to start to think about their chartering process in the same way, which is important if you have a pull-from-the-top mentality. One of the things that I like to do with teams is even if you draft 20 charters, it's not necessarily the case that you're, you're going to be the one executing those. We prioritize them as, as a team, and everybody pulls from the top. So sometimes you might get your charters, sometimes you might get somebody else's. Another thing that can be very helpful is that uh, is using testing polarities. And there's a PDF, I link to it down here, again, a uh, product of James Bach and many, many others, John Bach, Michael Bolton, who talked uh, in this series of webinars earlier this week, um, and uh, a bunch of other really smart guys. Um, they outline some polarities that are unique to, to, to testing and unique to exploratory testing in particular. And, and those polarities can be super helpful when you do your chartering. And you can kind of view this as a, as a set of exercises that you can go through um, periodically. I wouldn't use these all the time, but periodically I might dust these off and go through my charters and, and play around with them. And there's two ways to think about them. You can think about them in your charter. So while I'm chartering, I can say, I want to test feature A and compare it to feature B because they do similar things, right? So I have a, a profile, a user profile screen where they can um, change their password. But I also have on login, there's this link that they can click to change their password. And both of those features, while they both change the password, they're two different sets of code and they work a little bit differently. So I can do a charter to compare that to make sure that it's, a, it's one succinct user experience and I'm not getting different email templates from each one and I'm not getting different, you know, it's not a different process, a fundamentally different process. So that's a feature versus feature example. And you can bake that right into your test charter. That can be the goal of your charter. Another example is that while you're chartering, you can think of um, different things that will lead you to different test ideas. I like the, um, the idea of uh, lab conditions versus field conditions. So what would be a set of, of charters that I would design for a product in a pristine environment where all the data is clean and, and I'm 100% sure that there's nothing bad going on? And then what would those charters look like if I was in the wild and I had crazy tester data out there and users uh, from, you know, 100 million users and who knows what the heck they're going to put in there and what they're going to be using it for? How does that change the test that I would want to run? and the things that I would look for as a tester. That's an incredibly powerful way to come up with some new test ideas um, and to get you in the practice of thinking through things differently. So pull down that PDF, look at this list, play around with it, um, and use it a couple of times when you do your chartering. And if, if you don't get any value out of it, stop using it, but give it a try. Another thing you can do is let charters emerge over time. And this is a, this is a fundamental tenet of session-based test management, but I find that even though it's a fundamental tenet of session-based test management, very few teams actually let this happen um, in, a, in, in a big way. And the process is simple. You pull down a new charter for testing, you execute that charter, you debrief, and you add your new charter after you debrief and you reprioritize those charters. And this process just keeps repeating. And one of the things that I'm, I, you know, I try to be clear at with new people who are doing chartering for the first time uh, and they're working with me is it's okay if you feel like your charter execution was flat and you're not making progress, stop. Don't go the full 45 minutes. Don't go the full hour, whatever we said. Just stop. Come sit, sit down with me, debrief, and we'll just add new charters right there together and, and hopefully make them better. And then we'll just reprioritize, pull from the top, and keep going. 
And so if your team is really doing this, there should be no fear in saying, you know what, this charter that I pulled off the top, I don't understand it, or it's not a good charter for me, or it's just not a good charter. Go do your debrief, work with the person you're debriefing with to, to write better charters, and then just pull from the top again and just repeat. And if the team knows it's safe to do that, that they don't just have to go ahead down and plow through it just to make their numbers for that day, then, then, then that's good. They should be empowered to do that. Another thing that can be super helpful, this is uh, less in the immediate uh, category of how do you make this particular charter helpful uh, or better, but this is more in the long-term category of how do we make our charters better in general as a team, and that's to start tracking some metrics. There are some um, great metrics that uh, James and John Bach outline in their session-based test management paper about setup time and testing time and time for investigation and stuff like that. There are some other ones that I've been um, tracking over the last few years. And if you just do, you'll notice this dark blue where I put like a B in parentheses or a C in parentheses or a question mark in parentheses. Those, I, I take all my notes in, in TextPad. And after I'm done, I have a quick Ruby script that goes through, parses out all those notes and spits them out to me. So all of my open questions just get pulled out of my notes and I can quick shoot off an email that just says, here are the five questions that, that came to me while I was doing my session. All of my bugs just get pulled out and I can then go back and write up full tickets because I don't like to write bugs while I'm doing my testing. I like to just note them and then write them up later because I don't want to get distracted. Um, automation tasks, if I identify something I want to automate, I put a little A in there and then I can, I can pull that out later and I just get this list of all the things I want to go back and write automated scripts for. When you get good at that, you can start to measure it over time and that will potentially lead you to different, more effective and efficient ways of structuring your charters to begin with. But you need that data to know that. And, and once you start collecting it, you'll be able to, not only will it make you more efficient, I hope, but you'll, it'll give you insight into the way that you've been structuring your charters, and maybe there's a more efficient way to do it going forward. All right, so those were the specific tips for better chartering. Uh, each one kind of, you know, is not groundbreaking or earth shattering in its, in its, in its own right. But hopefully there's uh, three, four, or five of those that you can pull down this week or next week and start using to write better charts. Okay, we'll open the floor to any questions now. If anybody has any question, just type it into the comment box and I will put it to Michael. Um, just before we get on to questions, I'd just um, like to remind you that our early bird rates for the Eurostar conference in November actually finished this Friday. So in order to make the best available use of the... Um, Discounts available, um, book before this Friday to ensure the maximum discount. I'd also like to bring your attention to our chat facility, which will take place directly after this webinar at 3 p.m. You should have received a link to that in your emails today. First question coming through here, Michael, is from uh, Ger Gulbranson. Do you debrief right away after a session or after a few after every session sounds like it would cause much interruption to the work of other debriefers? So it's a great question. My, my answer is it, it depends. I personally prefer uh, if I can, if, and what I mean by if I can, if I'm the test manager and I have the time to do this, I prefer to debrief after every session uh, with my testers. Now, here's why that depends. If I'm managing a team of three people, that's sustainable. We, I can do that. Um, experience has taught me that, that that's something that we can do. If I'm managing a team of five people, I, I can't do that. There's two, it, just, it just breaks at that point, and there's too many. So um, one habit that we get into with larger teams, and, and even when the project is in a crunch and, and we just have to move faster than we want to, um, is I move to once a day debriefs, uh, where I'll sit down for an hour each day with, with my team and, and just have them debrief all of their charters in that time. And, and the reason why I like to do it real time is debriefs, once you do it a lot and you get good at it, they go really quick. Um, we can develop a shorthand um, within, with most teams within um, a week or two where most debriefs, unless something uh, went disastrously wrong, uh, take about five minutes. Uh, so it's not that big of a deal. But um, it, there are project realities and time commitment realities where if you have to do it once a day, do that. But I would strongly encourage you, don't let it slip past D 
debriefing every day. As soon as that happens, you start to the, like the value of uh, this process dramatically starts to decrease. Another question from Philippe Antras. Do you keep charters to reuse them or do you create them on the fly? Yes, uh, we do. Uh, it, and uh, sometimes um, what we try to do is over time, so early in a project we, we go straight charters all the time. And then over time for that same product, uh, we will start to build up test automation, uh, of course. And then we also start to build up checklists. And this is what one of the things I mentioned very quickly on the, um, the wiki pages for the product. So one of the things that, that I like to do is on those wikis, you start to create these checklists of the common things that go wrong or the common things that you want to, you know, you just, you know, every time you touch this, you should go in and do these five things. Um, that is a, a great way to do that. But at the end of the day, if you have a great charter um, that you know you're going to want to use for regression testing purposes in, in the future, set that aside somewhere, um, document, uh, you know, add a little bit more uh, detail sometimes about test data and stuff like that, you know, you can crisp it up a little bit so it's clear um, for people who come and look at it later, but uh, it's not uncommon for us to have a test bed of maybe um, 10 to 30 charters that we know we're going to do before every release, and that's just a rinse and repeat cycle. We, just, we know we're picking those up off the shelf and we're going to run them. Okay, thanks, Michael. Another question from Marit. PRV, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. How much of time would you suggest to plan to charters outside charters? Um, so I'm thinking through past projects. So typically, if so, let me give you a, a scenario from a from an agile team. Uh, so imagine a project uh, with. Uh, 10 developers and three testers and they go into sprint planning uh, for Scrum. They identify the stories that, they're, that the team's going to commit to deliver in that sprint. Here's what my expectation would be for those three testers on that project team. That by the end of the first day, once we know what the charters or what, the, I'm sorry, what the stories are that we're going to deliver as a team, by the end of the first day, they should have their first pass complete of high-level charters. And that's going to take them some time. That's probably going to take them a couple of hours because there's conversations with the developer, conversations with the product owner. They're going to be pulled into other sprint meetings anyway um, as the team tries to get clarity on, on some of those stories. And the tester needs to be a part of those. So so I, my, my guess there is, is they're going to spend a couple hours that first day getting their first draft charters locked in. And I say first draft because they're going to change, right? We're going to add more charters as the, uh, as the sprint unfolds, no question. But I at least want a high level. I want to set the expectation early on how much testing do we think we have to do to be successful in the sprint. Because if we're out of alignment, if we know by the end of the first day that, that we don't think we can get everything done that needs to be done, then we need to raise that flag and talk through it and figure out a strategy for dealing with it. Um, on the second day of the sprint, so on that Tuesday morning, we're going to come together as a team. We're going to walk that list, prioritize them, get any clarification. And then at that point forward, my guess is that team is probably each tester on the team is probably going to spend an hour a day thinking about charters, updating their existing charters, deleting some charters, reprioritizing their charters. They're probably going to spend an hour a day doing chartering um, up through that the rest of that first week, and then maybe into the second week. That's really when they're heads down doing a ton of executing, and at that point, any charters they're probably writing are related to um, things that they found while they were doing their testing. I hope that answered the question. Okay, the next question is from Shmel Gershon. Hi, Mike. Can you give a specific sample of a charter which explicitly explicit, explicitly includes polarities? That explicitly includes what? Oh, polarities. Yeah. Polarities, yeah. So uh, here's an example. Um, my mission is to test, uh, well, you know what, I can't do that without a product. So let me give you a product. Let's say we had a product called um, StatSims. StatSims is a football 
uh, American football, I should be clear about that, uh, it's, an, it's an American football simulation engine that allows you to look at the point spread, like the Vegas point spread, and you get to put in your data to, um, to determine uh, if your point spread works uh, is better than the Vegas point spread. And it's, it's there to kind of help you with fantasy football and to help you with gambling if you're into that. So let's say you had that, that, that's the product, right? So here's an example of a polarity. Um, my mission is to test the StatSims engine uh, using data from the production environment. So, and, and in that world, I'll, I'll add some editorializing, the data from the production environment there means the crowd, right? The, the hundreds of thousands of users out there in production who are making, uh, who are making predictions. So that would be one, that would be one charter. And, and that, that probably wasn't a good one. I already, having said that, I think we need to refine it because I didn't specify risk. So let, let's change that a little bit. So um, my mission is to test the StatSense engine using production data or data from production uh, to look specifically at how um, calculations for quarterback performance, the number of interceptions they're going to throw, things like that, um, affect uh, my my predictions relative to the crowd. So that's one charter. Then I would immediately follow that up with another charter, which is my mission is to test the StatSims engine uh, using handcrafted data, specifically excluding any quarterback predictions. Uh, so I can test quarterback predictions and see how my results relate to the crowd. And then I would have a third charter, which is um, my mission is to test uh, the Saxon's engine to, to using handcrafted data where we've added an abundance of quarterback rating data uh, so I can see how my predictions relate to the crowd. And the polarity there is, is the one of lab conditions versus field conditions. So we as testers love lab conditions, right, because sometimes it's the only way we can prove that a calculation is working the way that we think it's supposed to work when that calculation runs over a very large data set. And so that was kind of the last two charters. That was lab conditions. But one of the one of the risks that we run as testers when we only focus on lab conditions is we lose sight of the big picture and we don't recognize that field conditions are not lab conditions and that a lot of problems can occur. So that's an example of uh, field conditions versus lab conditions. A question from Philip Hoban, Michael. Um, do you have experiences in showing the session charters to FDA auditors, and how do they value the info? What information is most valuable to them? Yes and no. Um, here's the yes. I have experience running session-based test management in an FDA-regulated environment, and I did sit down with auditors before we did the testing and walked them through the process and told them how we were going to do it, showed them examples, showed them templates, showed them the tools we were going to use to manage the process. And they liked it. Uh, they were a little nervous, but they liked it. And they said, let's go. You, you can do it. You're approved. And then we ran the project, and then they never followed up. So, so, so yes, I've sat down with FDA auditors, and uh, I got approval, and we ran the project. But they never came back and said, show us your test results, show us your data. Show. They, that never happened. Um, if they had come back, we were prepared for that. We had super detailed notes. We had screen captures of all the testing that took place. Um, so we had tons of data, and we could recreate anything if, if that was required. Um, but uh, but they never came back, so I can't tell you that I sat down uh, post-execution and had to have that conversation with an audit. A question from Rachel Warrington here. Should the person carrying out the debrief have knowledge of the product? Where I work, people with no product knowledge are taking debriefs? Um, yes. The person carrying out the debrief, everybody on a product team should have knowledge about the product. Does the person carrying out the debrief have to have expert knowledge of the product? I, to that I would probably say no. They don't have to have expert knowledge of the product, but they absolutely have to have general product of the knowledge. There's no way they can coach you or guide you around risk and coverage if they don't understand what risks exist in the product or what areas of the product need to be covered. So at a high level, you know, they, they at least have to be able to articulate risk and coverage. If, if they can't do that, there's a problem. If they can do that, and, and what you're getting at is more of 
they don't understand how this API works, well, that may be okay. Um, you know, your mileage may vary depending on the size of the team, size of the organization, and what it is you're trying to do. But, but absolutely, they have to understand what it is you're doing and how that ties into the bigger picture. Habib Motara asks, can you give specific examples of dynamic metrics used in a charter? Yes. Um, so here are some metrics uh, that I use when I um, manage teams. So I'm interested in charter execution velocity, which is uh, a dynamic metric. And, and let me give you an example. It's just like a burn down chart in Agile, right? So when you're looking at how many story points we completed, um, today because we, we want to see that burn down cleanly to the end of the sprint. Um, charter execution velocity is the same thing. On most teams that I manage, most of the time a good tester uh, can do about three or four charters a day. And it's useful before, um, before you freak out about that if you've never done charters, it's useful to keep in mind that most of my, most teams I manage charters are about 45 minutes. And 15 of that minutes is, you know, lost to restroom breaks and setup and checking email and stuff like that. So, so that's why it's 45 minutes because it's hard to get an hour of somebody's time. And, and what that says, when you say they're doing three to four charters a day, that means for four to three to four hours, they are not checking instant messenger. They are not checking email. They are not in meetings. They are heads down, not answering the phone. Their heads down, police line, do not cross, do not disturb, I'm running tests. And that is a tremendous amount of testing. Four hours for most people on most teams, four hours a day is about all you get to yourself at best. And many people struggle to get that at certain phases of the project when there are tons of meetings and, and, and tons of interruptions. And so um, it, when you recognize that, when you say, you know what, most people are probably going to get three to four charters a day, it becomes very... Um, very critical that you track your velocity as the team progresses because as the manager for that team you have to be laser focused on making sure just like that you know scrum masters do you're removing roadblocks for your team you're getting the productivity you need out of them you, your team's making the progress they need and and that you're not completely stopped up so one measure is how many are we executing a day another measure which is dynamic which is how many new charters are we creating each day Early in a project, it's not uncommon, in my experience, for the team to create on a daily basis to create more charters than they execute. So if the team knocks out 10 charters today, I would expect that they would create 10 to 20 charters. Late in the project, that flips, right? The team starts to create fewer and fewer charters and they execute more and more. Um, but early on, while you're still learning, right, simultaneous learning, test design, test execution, while you're learning, you're going to be creating more charters because you're you're uncovering new risk and, and new areas of coverage that you may not have known about. Um, and so those are some great examples of dynamic charters or dynamic metrics. There's tons of other dynamic metrics that, that any test team is going to measure, like um, criticality of defects um, uh, for de you know, like how many defects we found today and how critical were they, um, how many um, how many automated scripts we created today? If you're doing test automation on an emergent basis, how many were executed? How many failed? Like all of that stuff, you're, you're still looking at all of those. But specific to chartering, I'm very interested in execution, new charters created, and charters closed. Okay, Michael, the questions keep coming in here. We'll just take a couple more before we finish up. Here's one from Volker Thatt. How do you structure charters for later reporting? Do you use key areas or other dimensions? Yes, I'm a big fan. If you've never seen it, go out and look for uh, James Box Low Tech Testing Dashboard. Uh, something you can put up on a whiteboard or you can put it in a, a spreadsheet. Um, but it's a great way to think about how you structure your, your charters. Um, very simply, he would say come up with five to seven areas that you're going to, broad areas that you're going to, that you're going to be doing your testing in and slot all of your, and they should be roughly equal size and slot all of your charters into those areas. And that becomes your high level metric of talking about, we've started this area, we've stopped in this area, we're blocked in this area, we've made good progress in this area, right? So it, it kind of sums it up. So at a, at a management level, you can talk about broad areas of the product. Um, take a look at that dashboard if you've never seen it. It's a great way to structure your testing. Okay, one last question from Daniel Contos. 
usually how difficult is traceability when working with charters? Um, it depends on the tool that you're using. So um, if your team's using Jira, charter traceability is a piece of cake because your charter just becomes a ticket or a task that you can link back to the, the story that the developer is working on. If you're using a, a, a more traditional test management suite like um, uh, Rational, IBM Rational or HP, you can put your charters into those tools as test cases, right? So just take their test case artifact uh, and just make it a charter. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a place to document tools. And then you can trace that or document your, your notes. And then you can trace that back to requirements and you can get traceability from there as well. And, and the FDA audited space, that's, that's exactly what we did. We put our charters in Test Manager, traced those back to Requisite Pro, and, and just treated them like charters instead of test cases. And there's nothing wrong with that. But um, on, on other teams, we don't trace, you know, traceability is not important to us. And so we just do our chartering and whatever tools the team wants to use and don't worry about traceability. But if you have to, you can use the tools that you're using today. Nothing should have to change. Okay, Michael, thanks for a great presentation. Um, before we finish up, I'll just remind everybody about our chat facility at uh, 3 p.m., which is just a little under five minutes away. Um, if you join us there, you have a chance to win a place at the Eurostar Conference this year. Thanks again to Michael and to everybody who attended. This webinar is now over. Have a nice day.